Uh, thank you very much, although um, I'm slightly tempted to insult the audience by saying you must be completely mad, all of you coming here for a discussion of Marx's, not just Marx's capital, but Marx's method in capital. But in fact, I think, sorry, a, a pun has just occurred to me, there's method in your madness. Um, sorry, very obvious. Uh, you can only get very boring jokes from me. Because I think that... Um, I think, I think that why there's such an interest in this, uh, this kind of topic um, isn't simply because of the kind of work that David has been doing, tremendously important though it has, to make capital accessible to people who are becoming radicalised and want, wanting to understand the world uh, and how, how it works, as, as Sally, Sally suggested. It's also because, in a very obvious way, we confront a very profound crisis of, of capitalism, um, and that crisis itself, as we saw with things like Occupy, is stimulating a new process of, of radicalisation. And where, what's the natural meeting point of that radicalisation and the dynamics of the crisis? Marxist capital. Because Marxist capital is um, a profound attempt to understand the dynamics of capitalism, of course, in order to help overthrow capitalism. And where capital, as an intellectual project, starts <coughs> is precisely with crisis. The first of Marx's economic manuscripts, the Grundrisser, he writes in 1857-1858 um, in response to the uh, to the outbreak of a major, guess what, global financial crisis. Some commentators argue that this was the first really global crisis of capitalism. And this, the outbreak of this crisis drives Marx, Marx back, as he says, to his economic studies. And in the course of doing that, well, he doesn't just produce the Grundrisse, the, the, um, the first version of, of capital. He does produce the group research, which is an enormous manuscript in the English edition, something like 900 pages long, full of detailed theoretical reflections, grappling with the great bourgeois economists like Ricardo, using Hegel's uh, science of logic to help him grasp the workings of capitalist economy. In addition to that, we now know, thanks to the scholars who are producing the mega, the complete works of Marx and Engels, that Marx wrote three thick notebooks um, going through the empirical details of the crisis. These notebooks, when they're eventually published, will themselves be another 500 pages long. And it's very interesting that there should be that combination of deep theoretical analysis and detailed um, empirical study of the crisis. Because that movement between the theoretical and empirical is one of the, one of the typical things about Marx's, Marx's capital. He's constantly trying to grasp, as he puts it, the inner connection, the inner mechanism of the capitalist system. But that it requires the most intensive empirical, empirical study. Now, it's Marx's tragedy that he actually brought to publication only a small fragment of the immense series of economic ma ma manuscripts that he, um, that he produced, roughly speaking, between 1857 and the late 1860s. Um, what he actually published was the contribution to a critique of political economy, not exactly a very snappy title, and then the first volume of Capital, his, his masterwork, and David has written a very important commentary on the first volume of Capital. But that's just a fragment of what he actually wrote. The other two volumes of Capital were published after Marx's death by his great collaborator Frederick Engels, from a manuscript, mainly from a manuscript that Marx wrote in the mid-1860s. The mid some, I should say, since I'm talking about Marx's method, I don't, some people think, argue that Marx could never finish because there was some deep flaw in his own whole intellectual project that prevented him from, from doing so. I don't think that's true. Marx didn't finish because he just couldn't finish things. 
right back in the mid-1840s, one of his main collaborators at the time, Arnold Ruger, wrote a letter to the philosopher Ludwig Feuerbach saying, you know, Marx is a genius, he's absolutely brilliant, but he can never finish anything. He's always starting things, starting manuscripts, and never finishing them. There was something of the past that meant he could never finish, and he left behind this enormous, enormous body of, of manuscripts. But I think part of what he certainly does rework and rework his analysis. And I think that's partly because he found himself engaged in a very difficult intellectual project. And that meant that he himself was greatly preoccupied with the, the method that he should pursue in this inquiry, inquiry of trying to undercover the dynamics of, of capitalism as a system. I, I've already mentioned the importance in writing the Grundrisse so of the first version of the successive um, manuscripts of what turned out to be capital. In doing that, he uses Hegel's sense of logic to help himself think through what he's doing. And what I really want to do in the, the limited time I have is to try and say something about why Marx is so preoccupied with that. And I think there are two principal and connected reasons. The first is that um, he's insistent on understanding capitalism as what he calls an organic whole. This is what he says at the very start of the group of research in a text that's generally known as the 1857 introduction, the intro what he intended as the introduction to his, his critique of political economy. He wants to understand capitalism as a whole. Now that in itself is a very radical thing to do. Because if we think about how capitalism presents itself to us today, you know, through the mass media, through news reporting, through academic textbooks and so on and so forth, what we get is not a sense of capitalism as an integrated system, an articulated totality, but rather as a mass of fragments that don't fit together in any kind of integrated whole. Now that presentation of capitalism as fragmented is, is something that, and I'm going to come back to this, that is an important part, why, why it presents itself like that, is an important part of understanding the nature of capitalism. But Marx, Marx is insistent that to, to understand capitalism is to understand how it fits together into a totality. But if you say that, that poses the question, okay, capitalism is a totality. How do you go about understanding a totality? How do you go about analysing a totality? I mean, there's some, you know, some people who, you know, often seem to be attached to some misunderstanding of an Eastern religion, you know, have the idea everything hangs together, everything is a whole, but they think that you can somehow intuitively get the way in which everything hangs together. But Marx is a very rational and scientific thinker. So how do you grasp a totality intellectually? And his answer, again that he famously makes in the 1857 introduction, is through what he calls the method of rising from the abstract to the, to the concrete. In other words, what Marx tries to do in his successive uh, manuscripts is to um, reveal the structure of capitalism as a system through setting, setting out in a highly ordered way a series of initially very abstract cat categories that he argues uncover what he calls the inner framework or the inner structure of the system. So if we go to his masterpiece, Capital Volume 1, he starts and first first chapter of, of Capital Volume 1 with the commodity, then he moves on to money, then he poses uh, the nature of capital as money that expands itself, that grows, then to answer, to explain how capital is capable of expanding itself in this way, he then introduces the category of labour power, um, and that takes us to the the secret of capitalist exploitation, that the worker in selling his or her labour power to the capitalist um, 
is then um, exploited by the capitalists, producing more value for the, for the capitalists in the, in the process of production that the capitalist organizes that is represented in the value of the workers' labor power, which is paid for by the capitalist um, through the wages that the worker, worker receives. And this continues through, throughout capital, an ordered introduction of categories. And it's not just that there are a succession of categories through which Marx seeks to uncover the structure of capitalism, but it's very important that they're introduced in the right, the right order. So he's very critical of his great predecessor, the political economist David Ricardo, for mixing together the abstract and the concrete. And in particular, not analyzing the, um, the process of exploitation and the nature of surplus values arising from the process of exploitation, not analyzing it in isolation from many other concrete features of the system, like the formation of the rate of profit, the emergence of rents, and so on. So Marx is very insistent on the importance, not just of constructing a set of categories that can un uncover the inner structure of capitalism, but ordering those categories in a way that follows this course from the abstract to the concrete. Why is, her, is he so insistent on this? The answer to this comes in the third volume of Capital. Now, as I said, Marx sees exploitation as taking place in the process of production, and that's what volume one of Capital is about. In volume three of Capital, he studies what in the manuscript he calls the total process. In, in other words, the unity of the process of production and of circulation. This is where he's looking at capitalism as a, as a whole. You have to look at the process of circulation, in other words, the sphere of the market where commodities circulate and where critically cap capital circulates in specific forms that he announced analyzes in the second volume of capital. But he says uh, in, in volume three, the actual production process as the unity of the immediate production process and the process of circulation produces new configurations in which the threads of the inner connection get more and more lost. And that's, that's a crucial passage. The, 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 the unity of production and circulation produces new configurations in which the threads of the inner connection get more and more lost. What is Marx saying here? The inner connection is the basic process of exploitation that Marx analyzes as taking place within production in the first volume of Capital. But when that is set in the context of the process of circulation, the circulation of commodities and capital that he starts to look at in volume two, this inner connection becomes mystified. It becomes obscured. And how, how it becomes obscured is in particular through a process that he calls externalization. And I think, I mean, it's a difficult world, that the word that comes from Marx's Hegelian background, but I think he's talking about the way in which if we look at the workings of capitalism as a system, it, it takes on this appearance of fragmentation, so that what happens in different aspects of the capitalist economy become separated from each other and seem to have no intrinsic connection to each other. The most extreme case of this is um, in, in, in finance. Marx argues that what we would call in finance, what he calls the credit system, you have most of the had the most extreme form of this process of externalization. On the money markets, it seems as if capital expands through its own power. Money is just able to grow um, without any intermediary uh, of, of production. And indeed, we see this um, in the contemporary financial markets. Um, the bankers, the hedge funds, bosses, and so on and so forth, are always talking about creating value. And when they talk about creating value, they simply mean making a, a particular amount of money growing through some manipulation of the financial markets that in no way is related to what happens in production. Now, the, the complexity of the situation is that 
for the practitioners in the financial markets, this fragmentation, this externalization has a reality. You know, if you're working in a hedge fund and you're trying to make extra money by through making bets on the difference, the differences between different national interest rates or something, something like that, it seems like this is a process where money magically, magically grows through these bets and the movements of the, the, the financial markets. And if someone in the financial markets was foolish enough to read capital or you know, watch David's lectures online or something like that and understand the real nature of the process they're involved in, that would simply confuse them and get in the way of their practical effectiveness as agents of the agents of the financial system. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, so, and this is one of the most interesting things about Marx's argument, that he, he argues that the way that aspects of capitalism like the financial system work is both mystifying, misleading, a crucial part of the functioning of capitalist ideology, but also a necessary part of the functioning of the system. It's necessary for the system to work that its, its agents genuinely take, accept the way things appear to be working in order for it to work effectively. Now, to understand what's happening, therefore you need what Marx, at one point, at the beginning of Capital, Volume 1, calls the power of abstraction. You need to be able to bracket, to set aside all these concrete and mystified features of capitalism in order to, to grasp the inner nature of the system. You need that abstraction, particularly at the start of capital, to grasp the real nature of the system in the process of production without the distorting um, effects of circulation. But the process of analysis has to continue. Marx talks about rising from the abstract to the concrete. In other words, Marx's analysis seeks to incorporate all these more concrete and distorted features. So, I got into a silly argument with someone on Facebook a few uh, weeks ago. <laughs> Actually, I could have ended that sentence um, without a few weeks ago. I'd always get, like many other people, often getting into silly arguments on Facebook, where this guy was saying, of course, you must accept that Marx has nothing to say about finance. And I said, rubbish. You know, th there are 300 pages of Capital Volume 3, where Marx looks at the financial system. It's a bit chaotic and messy and so on because it was edited from his manuscripts, but he's very interested in the financial system. But the critical move that Marx makes, critical to this whole process of rising from the abstract to the concrete, is that he illuminates the real nature of the financial system by setting it in the context of the whole totality of the capitalist mode of production. So he allows you to understand that all these generations of the financial markets, the manipulations of the hedge fund boss, bosses and the investment bankers and so on, is only possible because what they're doing is competing from portions of the surplus value that are being extracted from the workers in production. So that financial markets blow up great bubbles of speculation that seem to be autonomous of the process of production only for their real dependence on the process of production and on the extraction of surplus value in, in the process of production to be reasserted in, mom in moments of, of crisis. Just want to make one last point in, in confusion. It was in confusion. That, <laughs> that was a very revealing slip, wasn't it? <laughs> but actually, the, a lot of the, in the manuscript, a lot of Marx's discussion of financial markets has the heading, the confusion, um, as he tries to describe how completely mystified the bankers and so on are when they're confronted with a real financial crisis. So we could call a big aspect of the contemporary crisis the confusion. I don't want to present what Marx achieves in capital as too finished and too coherent because it's a work in progress, an unfinished work, and it's a work where there are uncertainties in Marx's approach, like he starts off writing Capital, or writing the, the original drafts of Capital, wanting to set aside from his analysis phenomena like credit and competition, 
But more and more, as he rewrites the manuscripts, he draws these very important features of capitalism into his actual analysis in capitalism. And that introduces a degree of tension and uncertainty in the argument. In the argument. I don't think that's a terrific problem, because what we're talking about is an unfinished scientific enterprise. Unfinished not just because Marx didn't finish in all the different ways that I've described, but also because it's necessarily unfinished, because it was it's simply the beginning of a much larger project by those who build on Marx's work of trying to understand the dynamics of capitalism as a system. But without what Marx did and the method he pioneered, we would be in the dark in confronting what's happening in capitalism today. Just a footnote on a couple of things that uh, Alex said, which I agree with um, about Marx's uh, problem of finishing. There's a wonderful letter from his publisher that says, Dear Hollock Hair, Dr. Professor Marx, it's come to our attention uh, that your manuscript of Das Kapital uh, is 12 months late. Uh, if you do not deliver it to us in the next six months, we will have to commission somebody else to do this work. <laughs> And uh, there's a, um, I agree very much, by the way, about the finance capital. Uh, just for your information, uh, the volume two lectures are now going on the web. And I decided that uh, since Marx talks about the circulation process of commodities and money in the abstract in volume two, that what I would do is I'd bring all the stuff from volume three about uh, merchants' capital and commercial capital and finance capital in alongside Volume 2 just to see what it looks like. And it's very, very interesting, actually. And I think Alex's point about Marx having actually some very, very interesting things to say uh, about the financial system uh, that then uh, was, was in place uh, with some very interesting observations. I was struck with the parallel when Marx talks about uh, the role of the Mistaken Bank Act of 1844 uh, and how parallel it is with the mistaken configuration of the European Central Bank and its role in extending and deepening the crisis, which is exactly what uh, the Mistaken Bank Act of 1844 did. So there's a lot of materials there. Uh, the next two lectures to go online will be about finance capital in, in, the, in, in the volume two stuff, so you may care to take a look at it. I wanted to um, say that, you know, I was here back last November to give the Deutsche lecture on Marx's method, and I want to give a brief kind of comment on, on what I had to say there. Um, what what I, it occurred to me was that the passages that Alex referred to in the Grundrisse uh, depict uh, classical political economy as being arranged in what Marx calls a weak syllogistic form. Um, and you know, cutting corners, uh, this weak syllogistic form said, okay, there's a, a, a metabolic relation to nature which is universal. There are the laws of motion of capital which are, are general and deterministic and uh, the like. There are uh, the realm of particularities which is about the world of distribution and the world of exchange relations. And there's a world of singularity, which is about the world of consumption. And Marx suggests that these are arranged in this weak syllogistic order, because one of the things that classical political economy did was perpetually to try to naturalize what was in fact a social system. So Marx takes out all of the metabolic relation to nature stuff uh, deliberately, uh, because he doesn't want to get into sort of a, a, a sort of social Darwinist understanding of uh, the world. And when he does, of course, very much admired Darwin, he kind of pointed out that Darwin actually took his guiding metaphor from Malthus, and that led it, in other words, uh, so that Darwin took a, a social metaphor and introduced it into understanding the natural world, and then of course it comes back in as something naturalized about capitalism, uh, much later in the form of social Darwinism. So this, uh, this, this, this structure of uh, understanding uh, then kind of says that from a generality you kind of go down and it's all sort of weakly kind of stuck together. Marx poses against that a much more organic notion of a totality. 
which uh, Alex had mentioned uh, as, as being a way to, to look at things. But in, in his practice, throughout the, the capital has come down to us, the three volumes of capital, he sticks with the weak syllogistic structure. That is, he takes the world of generality and, and excludes any discussion in, in any detail of the world of particularity or the world of, of details of exchange. So, for example, he dismisses questions of supply and demand. He, dis he dismisses questions of, uh, of, 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 of about competition and monopoly. Uh, and, and in the world of consumption, he simply kind of says, well, that's the world of history. You have to deal with that. So there's no theory of consumerism in, in the three, three volumes of uh, capital at all. And in terms of the, the world of world distribution, the first two volumes of capital, in fact, right the way through to about halfway through the third volume, Marx systematically excludes any consideration of the way in which the surplus value is split up between the categories of rent, interest, taxes, a profit of commercial capital and the like, and, and presumes that they have no effect uh, upon the laws of motion of, 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 of capital. So he sticks with this world of generality, which is law-like. The world of, uh, of distribution he characterizes as being conjunctural and accidental, uh, being due to the play of social forces. And, and the singularity of consumption is something which is kind of about human wants, needs, and desires, which are all over the place and which you can't possibly uh, sort of systematically theorize. So that is, if you like, the structure he sets up. And he sticks to that really pretty rigidly. And, and, and uh, the result is that you get a, a story about the laws of motion and capital, uh, which uh, are actually very, very informative about, about how to understand that level of generality, but which need a tremendous amount of work when you want to take that, that level of generality and bring it to bear on an actual political uh, economic situation, actual historical situation. And out of that comes, if you like, what's sometimes called the two Marxes, the deterministic, law-like Marx of capital. And then there's a kind of voluntaristic, accidental kind of stuff that goes on in the 18th Brumaire and the Civil War in France and many of these political writings. And, and the curious thing is that many of these political writings don't make any reference whatsoever to things like, uh, you know, the theory of relative surplus value, absolute surplus value, or falling rates of profit and, and, and the like. So this, to me, it seems to me important to understand that Marx's practice is a, a very limited practice. Um, but using the power of abstraction, what he can do is to, is to get us to see certain things, get behind uh, uh, the fetishism, as, as Alex has pointed out, get behind the fetishism and try to understand something about the dynamics of a capitalist mode of production of no matter what era and of what, of what place and time. And I think that what was brilliant about the Grundrisse was finding a way to extract from the particularities of the crisis of 1857 and to generate a general theory that we could actually start to read almost any time historically before and after about the laws of motion of a capitalist mode of production, uh, how things work and, and, and the like. Now, in all of this, of course, Marx is using powers of abstraction. He's, he's, he's extremely... Uh, rigorous about how his abstractions work. And I wanted to spend just a little time sort of talking about uh, the distinction between Volume 1 and Volume 2. And volume 1, of course, is the, by far the most well-read uh, volume of capital. Uh, volume 2 is uh, not very well-read. I've encountered uh, quite several significant Marxists who said to me either, well, I just went through it once and God, it was so boring, I gave up. And frankly, it is one of the most boring things that, that, that Marx ever wrote. Um, the trouble is that its content is very significant and very important. Um, and the other problem with it is, as uh, Engels wrote uh, to, to somebody, he said, well, you know, there's no, there's no material in here for political agitation. Uh, you don't end up volume two with a kind of uh, call of uh, the overthrow and the, uh, the expropriation of the expropriators and all that sort of stuff that you get in volume one. You don't get anything of that sort. Uh, in fact, you get a horrible feeling when you've gone through, the, the, as Rosa Luxemburg did, that, that by the time you get to volume two, capital continue, can continue forever. And, and there's no reason for it to break down at all. And, and while there are various 
fragilities and weaknesses within the system, there's absolutely no reason why the system doesn't seem to be able to compensate. So there are all sorts of difficulties that come out when you get to the end of uh, Volume 2. But the one difficulty I would like to spend just a little bit of uh, time commenting on is, is, is the following. That Volume 1 um, uh, is about the world of production, and what Marx does is to assume that there's absolutely no problem of realising values in the market. So the market is always assumed to be there whenever you produce anything, it can always be exchanged its value because there's always somebody there who has the wherewithal to buy it and, 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 and that. So the question of realization is completely shunted to one side. And out of that comes a model of, a, of, of, of the dynamics of capitalism, which includes things like you know, the, the relative surplus value, the dynamics of technological change, uh, the, 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 the repressive uh, stuff that goes on around lengthening the working day and struggles of, of, a, of that sort, of that sort, and culminating, of course, in the general law of capital accumulation, which is about the production of an industrial reserve army and the production of increasing immiseration of the mass of the population, while great wealth is accumulated by, by those uh, at the top. So this is, if you like, the theoretical kind of conclusion. Of, of, of volume one, but it's a conclusion which is based very much upon, uh, upon the assumptions. And the assumptions are uh, really as, as, as follows. First, there's no difficulty of realization. Second, no role is significantly played by the way the interest rate works or the way in which finance capital or, or rent or, or commerce works. Uh, and, 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 and thirdly, that uh, you know, we're living in a perfectly competitive society. Now, what Marx does when he sets those, those, those rules up is at various points he, he, he diverges from them. I mean, I mentioned that he, generally speaking, avoids the question of relation to nature, but there are these spectacular passages in Volume 1 where he mentions it. Uh, there are three pages given over to what he calls the laws of centralization of capital, which would suggest that if capital is centralizing, the coercive laws of competition are not going to do their work, and therefore the value schema is very seriously in jeopardy. And this was something that Moran and Sweezy recognized in writing Monopoly Capital, that if you're in a situation of uh, monopolistic competition, as opposed to the coercive laws of competition operating in a pure state, then indeed the laws of motion of capital start to look very different, the value theory looks uh, very, very different. But Marx just gives us three pages about the role of centralization and backs off, and as far as I can tell, nowhere else in capital do we ever talk about it. Now, this is a typical kind of Marx move, that he sees, he knows there's something there, and it's very important, and he says one of the big levers in the centralization of capital is, of course, the credit system, but I'm not going to deal with that here, and, and, and so on. Uh, and so this is, a, if you like, uh, you know, the assumptions that underpin all of the argument in volume two, and therefore, when he comes to his final prediction about the increasing polarization of incomes and the increasing immiseration of the proletariat, all those kinds of things, these are contingent upon the assumptions he's already made. Now, volume two starts with a completely different set of assumptions. He also assumes that on an individual level that the commodities are exchanged at their value, uh, but he also, uh, well, he does this in volume one to some degree as well, he assumes a closed system which is that there's no trade with any outside, any outside world, and that therefore everything is in, in, encompassed within a, within a particular economy, or, or the whole world is, is now working according to purely capitalist principles. But most important of all, he assumes there's absolutely no technological change. Now, you know, all of Volume 2 operates as if there's no technological change. And all of Volume 2 also operates uh, as if, again, the credit system and all of that doesn't, doesn't matter, except about every fifth page, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but every fifth page in Volume 2, he says, now everything looks different when you introduce the credit system, but we do not have the possibility to do that here. He says that again and again and again and again, and at some point or other you say, for God's sake, you know, you keep on telling me it's so important that it, it, you cannot analyze... If you analyze fixed capital without the credit system, if you analyze the differential turnover times without the credit system, that's, that's crazy because uh, the credit system exists, in fact, to deal with all of that. And he keeps on saying, well, yeah, no, it looks different when the credit system, but I'm not going to deal with it. And he, uh, that's, what, that's why I got so mad about it. I said, well, okay, I'm going to introduce the credit system here and see what the whole thing looks like when you've got the credit system uh, right alongside all these different circulation processes, which are... Uh, which, are, which are going on. Uh, 
But, so that, but to assume also that there's no, there's no technological change uh, is, is a bit astonishing because, you know, the, the permanently revolutionary force that's described in the Capitalist Manifesto and is so brilliantly discussed in Volume 1 suddenly disappears from the story, completely from the story. I mean, occasionally, again, he, he relaxes the story. But So what is it that he starts to show? Well, he starts to say, well, what are the rules of realization in a capitalist circulation process? What are the rules of the game for, for the realization of value? And, and, and he's very clear about the nature of value. Value is not value unless it's realized. It's, it, it, it has to be a unity of production and realization. And so Marx is desperately concerned, I think, to establish the real possibilities of realization. And when he gets to this, he then starts to look at, at, at the way in which capital circulates. And you start to find some very, very interesting features that, that, that crop up in, in Volume 2 that, that completely contradict uh, the condition of the working class as it's outlined as inevitable under capitalism in Volume 1. For, for example, uh, he, he suddenly starts to talk several times about the role of working class consumption and its stabilization of the circulation of capital. That is, if, uh, if, if working class consumption is not at a certain level, then uh, the whole circulation will be breaking down because there's no market. And so at one point, he kind of says this. He says, contradiction in the capitalist mode of production. The workers are important for the market as buyers of commodities. But as sellers of their commodity, labor power, capitalist society has a tendency to restrict them to their minimum price. Further contradiction. The periods in which capitalist production exerts all its forces regularly show themselves in periods of overproduction. <clears throat> because the limit to the application of the productive powers is not simply the production of value, but also its realization. However, the sale of commodities, the realization of commodity capital, and thus of surplus value as well, is restricted, not by the consumer needs of society in general, but by the consumer needs of a society in which the great majority are always poor and must always remain poor. And he then goes on to say later on that actually this is one of the fundamental reasons for crisis formation under capitalism. Now, as we know, there are other places where he says other things are fundamental reasons for the crisis formation of capital. But here he's saying the lack of wage repression is in fact leading you to a situation where there is not enough effective demand in the market and as a result of that there is going to be a disruption to the whole circulation process of capital and you're going to bring it down. Now, at this point, somebody will say, uh-oh, here he goes, he's off on an under-consumptionist riff, you know, and of course we all know under-consumptionism is bad. But I don't agree with that, uh, that it's all bad. I think there are moments when it becomes very significant, and, and it's part and parcel of this story of, of, of how crises can, uh, can unfold. And right towards the end of Volume 2 of Capital, he, he introduces, and this is the very end of his life, he, he quotes at length from an article about somebody saying, well, you know, the problem is the working class doesn't know how to consume right. That is, they don't consume according to uh, capitalist rationality. So there is a necessity to encourage workers to start to consume rationally from the standpoint of capital accumulation. And this, of course, was what Henry Ford did when he introduced the sort of... Uh, five dollar, eight hour day, he sent social workers into the workers' homes to make sure they, they consumed and they just didn't sort of spend all their money on drink and, and, and women and gambling and all those kinds of things. They had to become rational consumers. And Henry Ford kind of said, we've got to pay the workers more because if we don't pay them more, they won't be able to buy our products. And when the, when the, when the slump first came in 1929, Henry Ford responded by raising the wages of his workers, simply for that reason. Now, he, as an individual, of course, he soon backed off and you know, the coercive laws and competition forced him to do something else. So there's this, this, this disjunction between what the role of the worker is as a buyer of commodities at the end of volume two of capital and, and what has to happen to them. And you then have to, when you, and this is what annoyed Rosa Luxemburg, is because the accumulation schemas at the end there would suggest that actually it is perfectly possible for a certain segment of the working class or a certain place in a certain time to be so mired in capitalist consumerism that they forget to, to, about being revolutionaries. And I think that this is actually what happened, as I mentioned this morning, after World War II when the second, in the United States, when the segment of the working class is suburbanized and, and, and becomes homeowners and is, 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 is captured to the capitalist consumerist machine. And so that you have to get then into the question of consumerism in order to understand uh, how this system kind of works. Uh, and in the United States right now, it's fairly well known that uh, the, you know, 
Consumer confidence and consumerism uh, accounts for about 70% of the activity in the economy. This contrasts with China, where it's about 35%, which is probably roughly where it was in Marx's own day. So we live in a society where the volume two analysis seems to me to have certain relevance, uh, which is rather different from volume one. And the big question, it seemed to me, when you start to look at the whole, how it all works together, that if you unify volume one and two around the thesis that production and realization have to be uh, part and parcel of each other, then you've got two, if you like, conditions of possibility of the sustenance of capitalism, one of which is given in volume one and one another of which is given in volume two, and they're deeply contradictory with each other. Either you're doing well in terms of the volume one analysis and you're really screwing up on the volume two stuff, or you're doing very well on the volume two stuff and you're screwing up on the volume one stuff. And I broadly like to submit that in the United States, for example, from 1945 to, say, 1970, mid-1970s, you're doing very well on the volume, the volume two analysis and you're screwing up on the volume one analysis. Workers are getting empowered, they're beginning to raise their wages, they're beginning to cut into the profits and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so you're, you're doing well on volume two because there's plenty of aggregate demand around and it's all working you know, very well on the demand side, but it's not doing so well on what the economists collectively call this the supply side. So you then get a switch and everybody says we've got to deal with the supply question. So we've got to go after the labor, we've got to actually repress wages, we've got to repress labor, all this kind of stuff. So you get the politics of neoliberalism which come in, which start to act in the volume one way, but the predictable volume one uh, sort of, sort of uh, consequences, increasing social inequalities to the level which we haven't seen since, you know, again, the 1920s, which is, which is predict what well, volume one basically predicts. So you're doing very well that, but now you look at the literature all the time, everybody's saying, where the hell is the effective demand? You know, and how is it, how is it going to be working? Well, we know how it was done in some part, it was through the credit system, which of course we can't deal with here, you know. So the, the, this, is the, this, is, this is the world, it seems to me, that, 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 that comes out from these two volumes, but you've got to understand that his statements in volume two are contingent on his assumptions, and his statements in volume one are also contingent on his assumptions. And it's very, you know, and it, it's a typical thing, of course, of Marx's enemies to take his, his statements out of context and treat them as if they're universal statements. But I'm afraid I also find a lot of Marxists do the same thing. And you've got to be careful about that. You've always got to say, these statements in volume one are, in fact, contingent on the assumptions. If those assumptions don't hold, then that story does not follow. And the same is true of volume two. But the real thing is to try to put the two together, and that was where volume three, I think, was meant to be uh, the crucial uh, issue. Unfortunately, much of volume two was written after volume three. Uh, so it's not, done, it's not done very well, and there's a lot of issues there, particularly the stuff about uh, what happens when you introduce finance and, 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 and the like. So just be careful when you're reading it to, to make sure that, that, that you, you've got the assumptions very clearly in mind and, and recognize that any statement which then follows is contingent on those, those assumptions. Let me leave it there, thanks. I actually want to come up here to speak. I just had a question, but I'll uh, I'll try and uh, formulate the question uh, so that you don't have to read it out for me. Um, Alex talked about um, Marx trying to uh, think about capitalism as a whole, to write about the contradictions as being holistic in a sense. And my question is, uh, and it's rhetorical in a way, is. Um, did J.M. Keynes try to do the same thing in the book he wrote on the, the general theory of employment, interest, and money? Um, my question was mainly to Alex because he said uh, that in, uh, in Marx's Capital, in one of the chapters, he said in one of, um, he said in one of Marx's um, chapters that uh, the main thing driving process is how money is expanding. It's, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but money is expanding exponentially. And so my main question was, um, what, if we introduced a negative interest uh, money system, would that kind of deconstruct the system? Um, this is an idea that um, a writer called Charles Eisenstein is talking about. He's an American writer. He's a really great philosopher. Um, and he's talking in London on the 17th, I think. But, um, but yeah, the basic idea is that if you have a negative interest rate, you're going to be Kind of, there's going to be over, over time there'll be less money in circulation, so um, we won't be this in the system now where everything is becoming more and more monetized. 
Um, it's an interesting idea, and I'd be interested on the Um, this is just a question for David. Um, you mentioned that Marx kind of doesn't really talk about technological change in Volume Two, um, but in I was, I, but I was wondering about how he does talk about the differentiation between labour time and production time uh, in Volume Two of Capital, and a place where he does talk about technology is in the fragment on machines and the gun greaser. And I wondered how the combination of the differentiation between labour time and production time, when that combines with transformations in the organic composition of capital, which is talked about in the fragment on machines, in the sense of labour time becoming less and less a part of the production process, but how does that affect the labour theory of value, in the sense of, is there a contradiction between a reduced amount of labour time in the production process within a system that still measures value uh, through um, uh, labour time. And I think that might be one of the problems with the crisis at the moment in the sense of I'm not sure that capital needs labour. It's fine, capital is finding very difficult to reproduce the relation with labour at the moment. I just wonder if you might be able to talk about that. Okay. I just want to add something to that. Um, I just want to mention the whole question of relating the totality to specific existence. because. I think that's really such a crucial thing in terms of the difficulty of grasping it because our experience is individual and acts seem individual and what Marx shows us is how you can grasp the totality of that. And I'm always struck by his example of the Moselle peasants when they, could, they were banned from collecting the firewood, you know, which seems a law against them and so on. But actually, the way he was able to go behind that and see that that law was passed in order to stop people being able, people who worked on the land, being able to have their own means of subsistence. And without having that means of subsistence, they were therefore forced, as part of a larger process, of free labour becoming used for capital. And from a simple thing like seeing that law being passed, he was able to see how it related to the whole system. And I think today that applies so much more because all the pressures of our rulers is to keep, to keep our experience fragmented, individual, isolated, alienated. And they are trying, if you like, to constantly never make, allow us to make the connections with the totality of the system. So in Ireland, we're told we're not the Greeks. And so actually it's part of the Marxist method for us to say, sorry, we are the Greeks. We wish we were more like bloody Greeks. You know, I, I, so at every level, they are trying to divide us. And therefore, the, the totality also extends to the level of ideas. And you know, so people believe that their ideas are very, very individual. But actually, I think, and I'd be interested to hear what speakers say about this, but I think that now, for us, it's almost easier than ever to argue that the base, the material base, influences the way we think. Because of the way that the economy, economic has become so central, you know, for years people questioned that as a deterministic thing. Today, it's very easy for us to make the argument, because the economy is so central, how the base does determine the ideas that we have, and the political institutions that we have, and so on. So I think from that point of view, Marx's method is never more relevant than today. William Morris, some of you may remember him, um, artist, designer, revolutionary socialist, beloved of the National Trust, said that as he read Marx's Capital, he suffered agonies of the brain and were reading the economic part of that great work. But he loved the historical stuff. Um, in many senses, that at least he did better than Althusser, who just wanted to forget the first economic bits. But the, the really important thing to say about that statement from Morris, Morris struggled through and worked hard and he, he got through the manuscript. But actually the distinction is a false distinction, because actually the, the, all of the elements of capital are both theoretical and historical. And that goes for the, for the central historical bits too for the chapter on the length of the working day, for the section on um, the division of labour, for large-scale machinery and so forth. And it's one of the problems that, that, that historians have had, I think, that a lot of historians have tried to find 
those categories in the, in the specific reality of capitalism in any given period. And it's found it very difficult to locate them. And they're finding it difficult to locate them for precisely the kinds of reasons that David and Alex have been arguing, I think. That is that, that what you're looking at in each instance there is that Marx is assuming an ideal category of what capital is, capitalism is, how it functions, and he's producing abstractions. And abstractions are what allow people to think. They allow, they're what you, allow you to encounter the, the mass, the mess of what the real world is every time you come across it. And without those abstractions, all you get is the particular, the local, the, and the, the contingent. And it's through the generation of precisely those logical and historical categories, even those categories which like the length of the working day, the argument about large-scale machinery and the division of labour, are themselves, are themselves particular abstractions that allow us to get to grips with the reality of actually how capitalism works in any particular Um, if I'm typical of uh, a lot of comrades, then I would say that um, I've read Capital many times, particularly Volume 1. I've been advised to read it in all sorts of um, ways, either from first page to last, or starting from the end yeah. chapter to the last chapter, and going back to the beginning. Sometimes I've been told to avoid the empirical detail at the beginning because it's too historical, and you, know, you get to the meat of the abstract rather than you get to you know, chapter 25. I've been told all sorts of ways to read it, but one of the things that's come out from the talk here is that you're kind of almost saying that, David, that Marx is not consistent from his politics to his economics. And if he isn't consistent from his politics to economics, God help us. Just normal human beings are not geniuses trying to deal with it. Um, but that's my worry. But I'll come up and say what my question was, which was this. Um, we've had a lot of interesting debates about the tributary mode of production, about the origins of the history of capitalism. When does capitalism start? What does capital have to say about the origin, date of origin of capitalism as a system. Yeah, I mean, one of the previous speakers just said that it can appear that uh, capital doesn't need labour. You know, the labour has become a smaller and smaller um, proportion, if you like, of the productive process, and therefore it looks like maybe it doesn't need it. And I think, really, that gets to the heart of, you know, the, the problems the system has got itself into, because um, far from not needing labour, it needs labour a lot, and uh, it relies on the service that labour creates. And I think that the whole thing is, is, is it is actually true that labour is becoming a smaller and smaller part of uh, the productive process as new technology develops, and you see it whether it's a car factory or whether it's even a supermarket. You know, that the, the amount of technology that there's around a human, the one human who is being employed, is greater and greater. And that's... Um, proportion um, of human labour being a smaller part of the process is precisely one of the underlying weaknesses that is, is the cause of crisis because actually the robots, the machines, you know, that the, the uh, equipment, the technology doesn't create a surplus. Human labour is the only ingredient in the process that creates surplus value. It's the only, and therefore the, the system, because it's not a rational system, it isn't that Mr. and Mrs. Capitalist sit at the top deciding, ooh, what should we do to, to, to make a lot of money? The drive for profit is, is, is the drive that actually makes each capitalist fight for what they think it will improve for them, and that can mean new technology, less workers, cheaper products, undercut competition. But that very same drive, in the end, causes the weakness of driving down the rate of profit across the system as a whole. It's irrational in the long run for the capitalists as a whole because you can keep on coming into these reoccurring, reoccurring crises. And what's interesting about crisis in capitalism, it's never seen as being, you know, intrinsic to capitalism. It's always got its own little name. There's the oil crisis or the dot-com crisis. Or, and each one is meant to be as if it's just these concrete things that's just an aberration. It's just sort of happened. This time, maybe it was rooted in the dodgy home loans in America, but each time we have to come back to it, it's rooted in the system itself, and this crisis is seen as being finance capital. Why was so much shoved into, why did the finance section of the system become so bloated, become so crazy with the gambling that we've seen? And it's because, precisely because the rate of profit would be driven down in the rest of uh, the, the system, and actually capitalists thought we can make a fast buck here. We don't understand it, we don't understand all the mechanisms and everything else in the city, but hey, this looks like we can make some easy money, and therefore that sense of it keeps coming back to the same thing that the speaker identified, which was less and less labour in certain chunks of production, but this in itself becomes the fault line of the system. 
Um, yeah, I'm probably asking you to travel doing this, but I want to highlight and why I think is a difference between the two speakers and encourage them to be a little more explicit about the differences between them, uh, methodologically as it were, even though it's a huge meaning, and obviously you don't want to get sort of too bogged down in issues around dialectics and the like. Um, I want to say two things really about where I agree with David Harvey and two points where I sort of disagree, and I think I agree more with Alex actually. Where I agree with David Harvey is firstly, really fundamentally, that you can't, it, it is necessary to do a lot of work to move from the level of generality, which, in which I really include, by the way, the notion of the tendency of the back poet fall, to the concrete manifestations of all the contradictions of capitalism which show up in any particular crisis. And if you simply leap from the level, a certain level of generality to the concrete, you're going to end up, in my view, with a very impoverished analysis of this current conjunction, the current crisis. Where again I agree with David Harvey is that, for example, one has to take into account the significance of the property bubbles, the boom, the, the, the way in which massive construction booms in Ireland, in Spain, or wherever, sucked in all this excess capital, and that has a very specific character in terms of contributing to the disastrous financial circumstances uh, that have blown up the banks in those particular countries, and of course in Britain as well, to some extent, and in America, without quite the same dramatic consequences as in Spain and Ireland. And I think if we, if you need, we need to recognise the specificity. That said, there's something about David's approach, and I don't think it's true actually in the Linnistic Capital work, but I think it is true in his more recent work. It's, it's a bit in a Negro of Capital, for example. Um, very good though that is in many ways. It's the organic, the approach to the organic interactions does away with, I think, that he has in that book, does away with the movement from abstract to concrete that Alex has emphasized. At least that's how I'm going to try to sum up a difficult argument very crudely. I think there is, it, it sort of, David sort of gave it away a bit to my mind when he talked about um, if you, you know, assuming perfect competition in volume one, I don't think that's right actually. I just think he leaves that question aside. He assumes a competitive system. He doesn't use terms like perfect competition, which are inappropriate anyway. But more fundamentally, I think David doesn't like the idea that production is so fundamental. Um, to the system, because he thinks that, and I think he's wrong to think this, but he does think this, it somehow displaces the significance of exchange and so on. I think it is possible to do both, to recognise the production of surface value is fundamental to the system, and that's why the working class have power and to understand the significance of those are on the levels of the analysis, but you've got to approach it in the right order. And I don't think they need to do that anymore. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to talk briefly in terms of my experience of being a, a party member over, over a number of years of the way in which, um, however familiar or unfamiliar you are with, um, with, with capital, actually in terms of our tradition, it's been absolutely fundamental as a guide to action and that actually, you know, for Marx himself, the analysis of the workings of capitalism was crucial because he saw himself as, uh, not as a theoretician, just to be a theoretician, but actually rooted in that whole concept of the self-emancipation of the of, uh, of the of the working class, and you know raising the theory to the level of, uh, of practice. And for me, when I first joined the party, the first debate which uh, I was faced with was the question of whether Russia and the Eastern European bloc, or in fact socialist countries and a whole range of other uh, were a range of countries, and actually. The SWP, I said at the time, but the rooting in the tradition of the analysis of the nature of capitalism and the way it works the fundamentals, which was that competition hadn't been really abolished in Russia, that therefore um, the exploitation hadn't been abolished in, uh, in, in, in Russia and so on and so forth, was absolutely crucial to explaining the phenomenon of state capitalism in Russia and, and Eastern Europe. I'm just going to flip now to 1989. If people remember back to 1989, the consequence of the collapse of the, the so-called communist states was, um, which we welcomed, and we were able to welcome in a way that the rest of the left were not were able to welcome, precisely because we had seen all those foment formations as you know where workers were exploited and needed to be revolutionary and so forth. But what were the conclusion? Was that communism was dead, 
and therefore Cecilia Marxism at the state, that capitalism was all triumphant and the market was all, all, all triumphant, and people should remember back, if they can do, to what it was like in, in 1989, actually having to face that phenomenon. And again, because we were rooted in, 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 a, in a profound analysis of capitalism, we were actually able to say that uh, it wasn't the end of history, as Viviano was actually saying, that the, 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 the fundamentals of crisis in, in, in capitalism would reassert themselves, and, uh, and of course we were absolutely uh, right about that again. And, and the importance of that is, is you know, the, the, the whole argument now that has been put forward, that, that in fact that the, the, the crisis that we are facing at the moment is not a fundamental crisis of, of the tendency of the rate of profit to, to, to fall, and, you know, this is, and, 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 and the capitalist class are trying to grapple with, it, with dealing with that, but in actual fact it's simply, as Judith was talking about before, is aberrant in terms of it's a, it's a crisis in the, in, in the financial sector, in the banking sector, and if we only deal with the bankers, then the problems will resolve, and it's actually crucial to us in terms of being revolutionaries, the, the, in terms of the long term, in terms of, in, in terms of building revolutionary movements, that we do actually have that fundamental deep category analysis that both David and, and Marx, uh, not Marx, I mean, sorry, that was just a full incident, I'd like to share my confusion with you, comrades, because they might be illuminated. Um, uh, there seem to be two kind of explanations of how capital currently uh, accumulates. One is uh, what we're all more familiar with, the generation of surplus value, how capital has to live off living labour, you know, vampire-like, the generation of surplus value. And the other, uh, David calls accumulation by dispossession, uh, or maybe Marx called this primitive accumulation. So my first question is, are they the same? Uh, are, do they mean the same thing, primitive accumulation, accumulation by dispossession? And then, what is the relationship between these two forms of accumulation in Marx's analysis, but also today, how they articulate together? Now, I, I might not try, and if I've got time, explain my question to everyone. What primitive accumulation is, is Marx talked about how capital kind of rips value from outside of itself, and it kind of kick-starts it. But then there's analysis that say, this isn't just something that starts at the origin of capitalism, but is ongoing. So the expansion of capitalism across the globe, it's continually ripping the value and wealth from outside of itself. But then some people extend this analysis to talk about secondary primitive accumulation, which is what happens when things are created within capitalist society, like the welfare state, like the NHS, which are non-commodified, but which are then privatised and commodified as another source of primitive accumulation. Or, you know, this is happening all, all around the time. So capital, like, is, is, is making through its crisis because it isn't able uh, to generate enough surplus through the classic way of the, through, through investing in labour through various problems. It's gone into a very decadent, parasitic way where it's cannibalising itself through prime and accumulation. And my last kind of question is how these articulate together. Because if you say you look at the movement of capital to exploit Chinese workers, is that through a cycle of investment and exploitation, or is it that those workers have kind of been made through peasant society, then they're exploited for a generation, and then capitalism chucks them away like a used hanky and moves to kind of to proletarianize another section of peasantry, or with women's labour, how you know how how labour has to be reproduced in the family somehow from outside the capitalist exploitation through domestic women's labour or whoever works in the home. So there's all these ways where, where value comes in through outside of that. And I, I'm terribly confused, but maybe, you know, if we can look at how those two are articulate, we can understand the state of capitalism today and exactly how dead it might be on the other. Yes, question for David, really. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, consumption's got to be a symptom of, of production, that you can't you can't buy things unless they're made first. So, what I'm saying, really, I suppose, is that under consumption, it, it can't be a causal argument, which is what you seem to be making. It's got to be actually uh, symptomatic from production. So, therefore, it seems to me it would follow that any sort of under consumptionist argument, or especially in a Keynesian form, could actually only, uh, or could actually deepen a crisis. I wonder if you could comment on that. Okay, let me just take a, a few uh, of these points. Um, 
<coughs> I think uh, a couple of things here. For instance, uh, on the question of accumulation by dispossession, you know, I, I don't understand why you know, people can't um, sort of be prepared to change the language sometimes. I mean, primitive accumulation is about the, the origins of capitalism, and that's where it's largely analysed. When it's ongoing, it seems a bit odd to call it original or, or, or primitive. And besides, if I'm, if I'm trying to talk to sort of Iowa farmers who've lost their land, or, or you know, inner city African Americans who've lost their houses, and, and I want to talk to them and I say to them, hey, it's primitive accumulation, they look at you as if you're nuts. Whereas if you say to them, you know, you've been through accumulation by dispossession, they understand damn well immediately what you mean. And, and I think, I think that, that actually that then says, well, what's going on in our economy? You know, six million people have lost their homes in the United States. Uh, what's happened to the value of all of that? Actually, uh, asset values in the United States have, have, have been diminished over this crisis. And of course, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's ethnicized and racialized. Uh, Hispanics, and I forget the exact figure, but it goes something like this. Hispanics and, and African Americans have lost about 60, 70% of their asset values in the last three years, okay? White population has lost around 30% of its asset values. Th 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 those asset values, are, that's real losses. Now, this is not, this is not, this is not sort of accumulation by, you know, exploiting somebody in a, in a factory. It's, it's, it's taking away people's livelihoods. And, 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 you know, this also is occurring simultaneously uh, in, among peasant populations and rural populations. And when I mentioned Iowa farmers, you know, and it's going on in the agricultural sector. This is a very large segment of where all of those, all of that, you know, and what, you know, what is this, this kind of... Uh, all, all of these companies do these. these the, what they do is they go buy up things and they strip them down and they sell them off. This is this is asset stripping. And so why I, I don't understand why people can't can't see that this is a fundamental way in which profits are being jacked up by robbing people, by simply plundering people, by by engaging engaging in predatory practices all over the place. And there are lots of scams going on out there. I mean. You know, you like to think that there might be somewhere or other be an honest capitalist, but it's very hard to think there is now, right now, because most of them are into scams and of all sorts of, all sorts of things. For instance, there's something called a reverse mortgage in, which, in the United States, where older people are encouraged, you know, if they need money, they can actually draw down the asset value in their house. The scams involved with that are absolutely horrendous, and people are being, you know, older and vulnerable people are being robbed, you know, right throughout the system. Meanwhile, the people who sit at the top of the system, the bankers, are getting their billionaire, billion dollars of this, and, and, and uh, you know, people like uh, Mitt Romney goes in and has Bain Capital, which does exactly that kind of thing and makes money out of it. So I don't see why people have a problem with that. Um, and why can't we talk about it and say this is a very, very significant part of what a, a capitalist economy is about? And by the way, Marx is a, Marx, and this comes back actually. Was Marx scientific, and, and what's the relationship? He, he really was trying to be very scientific in capital, and that meant sometimes he had to lay, lay aside his, his, his political prejudices or his political wishes in order to actually see something was happening that, that maybe didn't quite fit with some of the, the politics he'd been thinking about. So he's, he's, very, he's very honest in capital when he's exploring these things. So the politics kind of does go a bit wonky inside of, of capital because there are moments when, indeed, there's a challenge to the politics which comes out of the analysis. I mean, I think there's a challenge at the end of volume two that comes out of the analysis, which Marx is kind of, kind of really quite concerned about. So, so, I, I, so I, I think that the politics at the end is, of course, it's about human emancipation, and Marx is committed to that as, as anybody. But he realizes it's human emancipation from something, and what is it human emancipation from? If you argue that the only form of exploitation that is worth thinking about is that which is what happens to workers in the workplace, that's one form of emancipation. But what Marx makes very clear is actually where the, where, where, where the surplus value is produced and where it's realized are two different things. In fact, uh, you have an organization like Walmart, well, it's merchant capital, and what does it do to the producers? It produ it, 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 the, the, the producers, the direct producers, I'm not talking about the laborers, I'm talking about the capitalists involved in production, their profit rates are forced down really, really, really low. Uh, 
They meant very little, actually, in, in those, those, those workshops in China that Walmart utilizes. You know, the workers are even worse off. So, but, but all of the profit which is produced, uh, the surplus value which is produced there, actually ends up in Walmart's pocket, which is somewhere down the chain. And if it's not in Walmart's pocket, it ends up in the landlord's pocket, or it ends up in the financier's pocket. In other words, when you start to look at the circulation process of capital, you see all kinds of points where the surplus value can be realized. And they're not the same as where the surplus value is produced. And when I point that out, and therefore say the question of realization is important, then somebody says immediately, well, you're not interested in production anymore. Well, of course I'm interested in production. It's just, you know, look at the circulation process and how that production process is embedded in a circulation process, which gets you back also to the definition of what capital is about. I mean, actually, volume two is, is, is a beautiful place to, to, to think about what is the definition of capital. And, and if you're going to be anti-capitalist, you've got to understand what it is you're anti-capital, what, what, what it is you're anti, what's the definition of it. And this comes back to the question of the origins of capitalism, what is it about? Were there commodities floating around the world? Was there commodity production before capital came upon the scene? Answer, yes. Was there money? Yes. Was there even credit? Yes. Was there even labor markets? Yes. All of those things were there, so they don't define specifically what the nature of a capitalist mode of production is. The only conclusion you're left with is it's a class relation in production, which is in which one class produces a surplus value for another class. That's the definition. So if you're anti-capitalist, that is what you have to go after. That is what you have to absolutely uh, attack and, 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 and get rid of. At the same time as you realize that actually... If you just say, well, the answer is simply worker control and you're going to control production, but what you see is worker control ends up with self-exploitation if you don't control the other circuits of capital, i.e. the commodity circuit, the financial capital, and all the rest of it. And there was this interesting thing about the negative rate of interest. Actually, Keynes, uh, in the general theory, uh, had a very interesting little passage towards the end there where he's talking about stamped money. At the end of every month, if you want to maintain the money value of something, you have to pay in order to maintain its value. That's a negative... It's, a, it's, a, it's an accumulation tax. Imagine what all these billionaires would do when they're faced with actually paying 3% on every, on every penny in order, to the, in order for their money they hold in June to be valued in July. Imagine what that would be like. I mean, this would be fantastic sort of uh, world. So, so uh, and, 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 you know, and Keynes does overlap a lot with Marx in, in, in volume two, I think. There's no point uh, denying that fact. In, in fact, Marx, I think, had a, a role in the production of Keynesianism, you know, via Polish economists and all the rest of it, uh, simply, simply by virtue of the, the nature of the, the analysis that Marx is making in volume two, and I think that, that connection is, is very much there. Uh, Keynes did it in a somewhat one-sided way, and he did it to try to save capitalism. And uh, by the way, uh, just a minor point, I unfortunately know a couple of hedge fund people who have read my work, they like it, unfortunately. <laughs> and they use it, they find it extremely useful. It bothers me a lot. <laughs> Just on, on some of the questions. Negative interest rates. We have negative interest rates now. You know, the rate of interest in Britain is 0.5% and the rate of inflation is, what, 3%. We've got negative interest rates. I think the idea that negative interest rates can somehow solve the problems of capitalism is, is an example of the kind of funny money theories that Marx starts off the Grund Russo in, 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 in offering a critique of. When does Marx think capitalism began? Uh, read Capital Volume 1, Chapter 31, The Gen Genesis of the Industrial Capitalist, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, summary of how capitalism developed, which um, hasn't really been undermined by more recent uh, research. Does the rising method of rising from the abstract to the concrete meet Marx's idealist? No, because the point of the method is, as Marx says, to use the power of abstraction to uncover the inner structure of capitalism, which is a reality that exists independently of us. He emphasises this, that in moving from the abstract to the concrete, uh, we're trying to understand the real concrete that exists independently of us. Uh, I'm going to respond to Pete Green's re request to uh, talk more about where David and I disagree. And one place where I disagree is that I think this, this past... I think, David, you, over, you exaggerate the significance for understanding Marx's 
whole work of, of the passage on the, whatever it is, the weak syllogism in the introduction to the, the Grundrisse. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that explains the whole trajectory of the development of Marx's analysis. Um, that he, he just treats production as the generality that he's focusing on. As I said, in, the, in successive manuscripts, he moves from ex, his plan to exclude credit and competition more and more to incorporating it into his analysis. And it's not true that he doesn't discuss supply and demand. There's a very important chapter, chapter 10. I was checking all this on my Kindle while the discussion was going on. Um, chapter 10 of Capital Volume 3, where he focuses a lot on the role of supply and demand in the formation of what he calls market values. And in fact, there are other places where he discusses supply and demand. I agree that there's a tension between Volumes 1 and 2, and I think that, I mean, I'll be really interested to read um, what David had to say on, on Volume 2, because it is, in, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange work. It's a, Engels composed it from, oh, something like 10 different, different manuscripts, and it's still, in many ways, the most unfinished part of capital. I mean, it's not surprising that there's no discussion of technological change, because the final chapter, where Marx is dealing with reproduction under conditions of accumulation, is actually, I mean, I reread it recently, very surprisingly sketchy and so on. But as David says, Volume 3 is intended to represent the sy synthesis, uh, synthesis of Volumes 1 and 2. It's his analysis of the total process. And I think although there's all sorts of unevenness and incompleteness in, in volume, volume 3, and there are points where he allows himself to be distracted by side issues and so on and so forth, I think he does, to a large extent, succeed in achieving this synthesis. And I think this is most importantly true with respect to crises. Marx's original plan was to write a six-volume work of which Capital would be the the first book that would conclude with a book on the world market and crises, and he describes crises as where economically all the contradictions of capitalism are expressed. Now, partly because of that plan, he never systematically discusses crises in capital, but you have elements uh, of such a theory in different parts of the book, which I think partly explains some of the tensions that David is talking about. So when he talks about the Industrial Reserve Army in Volume 1, there's a kind of account of the business cycle and the role that rising wages as employment rises in the course of the cycle, the role that they play in uh, pulling uh, capitalism short. In Volume 2, there's the idea that disproportions between different sectors of production can contribute, can contribute to crisis. There's the problem of the underconsumption of the masses, of mass poverty, which he talks about in Volume 2 and also crucial passage in Volume 3. But there are two crucial additions that he makes in Volume 3. The first is the famous theory of the tendency of the rate of profit, profit to fall. And the second is an analysis of financial bubbles and panic that provides the spine of Marx's very extensive discussion of money markets and the financial system. And what I, the conclusion I've reached, and in a way this addresses Pete Green's point, is that the two are very closely related, because what Marx sees happening in the financial markets is a, is a, a process through which the development of financial bubbles postpone the effects of the fall in the, in the rate, of, rate of profit only to um, precipitate um, the, the, not the final crash of the whole system in the sense of the end of the system, but the, the crisis that has been postponed because of the way in which the financial bubble displaces the contradictions for a while. And it's very interesting, there's a passage that I quote um, in the, um, the latest issue of International Socialism, not from Marx, but from a, a writer called John Fullerton, who was uh, a British econo economist of the early 19th century. And he says, he talks there about the necessity of the destruction of capital, um, which takes place during financial crises, because 
the, the, the Fullerton argues the source of crisis is that there's too much crisis in the system. It's a kind of early period of over-accumulation. And in Capital Volume 3, Marx takes over that idea, but argues that what the destruction of capital is, is doing is overcoming the um, effects of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. The rate of profit to fall means that there's too much capital relative to profits. And what financial crises do, when they come, having the, the preceding bubble having postponed the onset of the crisis, is to destroy some of that surplus capital and permit the system to re return to profitable expansion. So there's a very close relationship between the theory of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and Marx's analysis of the financial system. And this may, you may think this is the purest of abstraction. It's not true. The biggest problem the system faces today is that it's failed to destroy sufficient capital to restore the system to profitable expansion. I just read the other day that only one car plant in Europe has been closed in the course of the crisis. That's great for the car workers concerned, but from the point of view of European capitalism, they need to shut down a very large segment of the car industry in order to make it profitable and competitive. That's one small in instance of the, uh, the much larger problem of the system's failure in the course of the crisis, crucially because of the bailouts and so on, to destroy, to prevent, to destroy sufficient capital to restore the system to profitable expansion. So some of the most um, apparently esoteric aspects of Marx's analysis are actually very relevant to understanding the dynamics of the present crisis.